In this presentation, we'll be talking about intervals. First, let's talk about conceptualizing musical space. Some cultures will use spatial terms to understand the relationships between pitches to each other. And the metaphor for this understanding is sometimes referred to as musical space. These spatial terms could include the words like high or low. In the common practice era, what you're probably familiar with, high pitches are those with greater frequencies up here on the right side of the piano. And lower pitches are those with lesser frequencies um, down there. Some cultures have different conceptions too. Sometimes in other cultures, high and low is reversed for a variety of reasons. But in these presentations, when I say high, I'm referring to something with a greater frequency or low, something with a lesser frequency. Also, pitches could be narrow or close to each other or wide or distant from each other. And in the common practice era style, pitches that are close are those with differences in their, with less differences in their frequencies. And those that are distant are those with greater differences in their frequencies. In the common practice era style that we'll be looking at, the distance between notes within musical space is considered to be an interval. These intervals would be measured by two aspects, a quality and a number designator. And we'll be talking about how to find Find, uh, we'll be talking about how to find each of those. So let's talk first with uh, about number designations. The number designation of an interval is determined by counting the distance in terms of lines and or spaces on the staff between any two pitches. Now this process is inclusive of the lines or spaces that each, that each note of the interval occupies. So we'll start usually with the lowest note and then count upwards, including the note that you begin on and the note that you end on. So for this first example, the F and the G, that is going to be a second because we count from the F one and then up to the G, that's two. So that makes a second, one, two. From the B to an A, we'd have We'd count up from there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just like that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so there we had our second before, and now that uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven makes a seventh. And then lastly, for this example, we have C up to G, or excuse me, I'm in trouble clef here, A up to E. We'd count A, B, C, D, E, and that gives us a fifth, one, two, three, four, five. So simple intervals are those between a unison, that's the same note, and an octave, that's essentially an eighth. We don't call it an eighth, we call it an octave. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And all of these examples that we've just looked at, the second, the seventh, and lastly, that fifth, um, are going to be examples of simple intervals. They're all somewhere between a unison and an octave. Now, when we encounter intervals that are greater than that, um, those are going to be known as compound intervals. Those are intervals between two notes which are greater than an octave. Compound intervals can be conceptually reduced to their correlating simple interval by simply imagining the two pitches are within an octave spacing of each other. So uh, for the common practice era, these will be functionally equivalent. Of course they'll sound differently. This sound, for instance, this first twelfth, the D up to the A, has a different sound than the close spacing of it. it. Sounds much, much more distant. In fact, it's harder to tell the quality of it when it's that distance, and we'll talk about that more soon. Or like this low G to a very high B. That's going to sound very different than if it's within an octave of each other. This one sounds very sparkly. This one sounds sort of rich, chocolatey. Um, but uh, they, for the purposes of what we'll be talking about in terms of chord structure, in terms of pitch function, they are going to retain a functional equivalency whether they are compound intervals 
or whether they are simple intervals and close together. There'll be some things that we'll talk about, like about voice leading, that we'll be treating differently if they are very, very high or very, very low, and rules that interact with that or tendencies that interact with that. But as I say, here are two examples, a twelfth, the D up to an A, which is, uh, I have a sort of equal sign in quotation marks. It's roughly, uh, it is functionally equivalent to a D and an A, that's a fifth. And usually you'll often hear people refer to those intervals not necessarily as a twelfth, but as a fifth or as a fifth plus an octave because they are functionally equivalent. Especially when you get to these really wide intervals like G up to this B, this 24th here. No one wants to refer to that as a 24th. They'll refer to that as maybe a distantly spaced third, but emphasizing that aspect of it. So we have those two kinds of intervals, simple and compound. Uh, ones that are within an octave and ones that are greater than an octave. So uh, within interval numbers, there is also a secondary designation that's uh, important to mention. Um, uh, we're going to divide the groupings of numbers into two groups, one that's going to be potentially perfect and one that's going to be imperfect. I say potentially perfect, we're going to talk about qualities in just a second, and you'll see that some of these intervals are not always perfect, but they are potentially so. Uh, but imperfect intervals can never be what's called perfect. Perfect has to do with uh, tuning qualities. But uh, unisons, that's the same note, fourths, fifths, and octaves, and all their compound intervals, those are all going to be potentially perfect intervals and will work in a slightly different way from imperfect intervals. Imperfect intervals are our seconds, our thirds, our sixths, and our sevenths. So, uh, and as well as all their compound intervals. As I say, these designations are based on tuning practices and will become important momentarily when we are dealing with interval qualities. And they'll also be important when we are dealing with voice leading practices as well, understanding what's perfect and what's imperfect. So let's now move on to quality designations. An interval's quality is like a fine tuning measurement that is added to the interval's number to help us understand that uh, the difference between a variety of sevenths. For instance, all of these, all of those intervals are different kinds of sevenths but uh, their quality is different. So, you uh, will recall that we just talked about imperfect intervals and potentially perfect intervals. The interval qualities will be different. There is a different list of them, though you will, of course, see similarities between them. Interval qualities of imperfect intervals, that's our second, third, sixth, and sevenths, can be either major, minor, augmented, or diminished. It will be one of those four uh, for, for now. You can also have doubly augmented and doubly diminished, but we're not going to be dealing with that right now. Interval qualities of potentially perfect intervals, the unison, the fourth, the fifth, and the octave, can be either perfect, augmented, or diminished. So you'll see that in that case there are less options. We don't have major and minor, we just reduce it down to perfect. So one of the ways that it's going to become very helpful to, uh, in identifying intervals is to become very fluent with our major and minor scales and memorizing which intervals are perfect or imperfect. This will help us to determine an interval's quality very quickly, and I highly recommend that those are things that you drill and that you work on so that you increase your fluency towards this. So let's talk a little bit more about how we're finding the quality. So there are numerous strategies to determine an interval's quality. Um, here's the one I find myself using, and this applies both to what are known as harmonic intervals. Harmonic intervals are just intervals that sound at the same time, and intervals that are melodic. Those are ones that don't sound at the same time, and it applies the same way, either way. So uh, again, if you have a different strategy, that's fine. We'll talk about another strategy as well, but this is the one I find myself using frequently. First, we're going to locate the two pitches that you'll be measuring and we will observe the interval's number, determining, of course, if it is potentially perfect or imperfect. So that's step number one. Is it a unison, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or octave uh, reduced down from, uh, or and if it's compound, we can reduce it down. 
Second, we will mentally construct a major scale based on the lower interval. As you become more fluent in interval identification, you may also want to construct a minor scale, but to get, begin with, I think a major scale might be simpler. Third, we're going to compare the top interval with the scale degree that matches the interval's number. And we will follow the process on the next slide, depending on whether it is potentially perfect or imperfect. So the, the initial three steps, find the interval's number, construct a scale based on the lower interval, and compare the top note in the interval with uh, the scale degree that matches the interval's number. So if it's a fifth, you'll compare it against the fifth scale degree. Note that I'm not saying compare it against the same note in the scale because it might be different than what's appearing in, in that major scale. That's the whole point of this. We'll be using the major scale as a metric to measure that interval against and see what differences might or might not crop up. So this next slide is a little heady. We're going to break it down and walk through this. You see that I have it uh, uh, defined on by side. We have our imperfect intervals on the left. We have our potentially perfect intervals on the right. So let's start with our imperfect intervals. This is for seconds, thirds, sixths, and sevenths. If the notes match each other, then the interval quality is major because it matches the major scale. And you'll write a capital M before the interval. So for instance, if it is a seventh and it matches the seventh scale degree of the major scale, then it's a major seventh. If the note you are measuring is one half step lower than the scale note, it is minor. Incidentally, you'll note, note later that it will, because, it will be because many of those notes will match the minor scale. And you'll write a lowercase m before the number. If the note you are measuring is two half steps lower than the scale note, it is what's known as diminished. And you'll write a little circle uh, before that number. For instance, here, diminished seventh. And if the note you are measuring is one half step higher than the scale note, it is augmented, and you'll write a plus sign before. So uh, augmented seventh. So uh, if it's a, uh, you see it my graph down here, if it's a half step higher than, uh, than what occurs in the major scale, you write a plus. If it matches the major scale, you'll write a capital M. A half step lower, you'll write minor for many of these intervals, but not all of them. That's why I have it in parentheses. It will also match the minor scale. And for two half steps lower, it'll be diminished. If you're wondering uh, those, uh, all the thirds, the sixths, and the sevenths, uh, if they are minor, uh, minor intervals, those will match the minor scale. The second won't. That's why I like using the major scale and then ad adjusting from there. All right, for unisons, fourths, fifths, and octaves uh, are potentially perfect intervals. If the notes match each other between the interval and the scale, then the interval quality is perfect, and you'll write a capital P before the interval. That's why I call these potentially perfect intervals, uh, the fourths, fifths, and octaves potentially perfect, because depending on, on whether they match that scale or not, they're going to be adjusted, which is what we'll see next. If the note you are measuring is one half step lower than the scale note, it is diminished and you'll write that circle sign. And if it's one half step higher than the scale note, it is augmented, and you'll write a plus before that number. All right, let's put this into practice. Talking, it, talking this through seems like a lot of rules, and I think it'll make a lot more sense when we actually see notes on a page. So let's go to an example. We have here a C and a G flat. We want to know how, uh, what interval that is. So. First, we're going to imagine, a, uh, first we're going to count the interval, 1, C up to G, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there's our C to G flat, and then we're going to imagine in this thought bubble a C major scale. We're going to build a scale uh, based on the lower, uh, the lower note. So we've got C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. We know C to G flat is a fifth, so we're going to compare what's going on with the fifth scale degree in the C major scale. And so in the second line of that thought bubble, I have a C and a G. That would be the fifth as it naturally occurs in the major scale. And we're gonna compare it with the interval itself, C to G flat. 
uh, difference between the G and G flat is that the interval is one half step lower. C to G, C to G flat. So uh, that's uh, we have a potentially perfect interval. So that means our options are perfect. If it's a half step above, it would be augmented. And if it's a half step below, it would be diminished. So a fifth that's lowered by one half step is our diminished fifth. Now that may feel like a lot to go through at first, but that this will inevitably speed up as you uh, increase your fluency, both with scales and getting used to intervals. There are some other strategies that you can use. Sometimes you'll come across a key signature that's difficult to deal with. In these cases, it might be easier to use a different strategy, which is simply mentally contracting or expanding a known interval to find what, uh, what the new quality is. Let's say, for instance, you have an F sharp as the lowest pitch and a C as the highest. And you might not want to think in F sharp major, which is totally understandable. However, you might know that F and C form a perfect fifth. Therefore, you can compare F sharp and C and F and C. Uh, the addition of the F on the sharp means that the interval has contracted. You can imagine this within your sense of musical space. You have an F and a C. If the F sharp goes up a half step, that musical space has contracted uh, and therefore has gotten one half step smaller, therefore making it a diminished interval. So let's try this out both ways now. Here's an awkward interval, B flat down to C sharp. So let's figure out uh, what this is using the first way that I talked about which is going to be cumbersome because it's a C-sharp major scale. It's a lot of sharps to deal with. So we think to ourselves, first, we're going to find that interval. What is that C-sharp? D, E, F, G, A, B-flat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's a seventh from C-sharp up to B-flat. Let's now find out what quality of seventh it is by comparing to the C-sharp major scale. So. We compare the C-sharp major scale, scale degree 1 up to scale degree 7 will form a major 7th naturally in the major scale. But that's not going to match that B-flat, so we need to start chipping away at that major 7th. We'll lower that B-sharp by 1, so it changes from a major 7th to a minor 7th. That's what we have C-sharp up to B-natural. Then we have to change it again, we lower it one more time. C natural up to B becomes C natural up to B flat. So now we lower it one more time. That means it's a diminished interval. So we went from major to minor to diminished. So we now know that that's a diminished seventh. Let's see what happens if we use this other strategy. We know that it's a seventh, but let's say that we don't want to deal with C sharp major. Let's deal instead with C major and work from there. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, e, C. Let's start with the known interval of C up to a B. We know that C up to a B is a major seventh because it's naturally occurring in the major scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, major seventh in our major scale. So now what we can do is start adjusting those intervals. Maybe we start C up to B and we lower that one half step, that B contracts down one half step to a B flat. So we change from major to minor. Now we still haven't matched this yet, so we're gonna adjust C, the C up to a C sharp. So it's contracted again. Minor seventh, contracting a half step is a diminished seventh. So either of these ways means that there are multiple steps. It's just depending on which one that you are most comfortable with. And sometimes you'll find yourself going back and forth between these different strategies. But either one you follow gives us a diminished seventh. Very briefly, sometimes you will also hear talk about interval inversions. And we'll need to determine what the quality and number is of the inversion of an in interval. The interval's inversion is uh, taking the what was the bottom pitch and what was the top pitch and flipping those. So now what was on top goes on bottom, what was on bottom goes on top. Though you can certainly measure these intervals and we'll go through that, there is a shorthand to use which is subtract from 9 and flip the sign. 
So to find the new interval number, we're going to subtract the original interval number from 9, and we're going to assume that we have, um, that we have reduced any compound intervals to a simple interval. We're going to subtract the in original interval number from 9. For instance, a fifth would become a fourth. Then we're going to flip the sign or quality. For potentially perfect intervals, you can imagine a, a column of three. That, uh, middle, uh, that middle row is not going to change. A perfect interval will always invert to a perfect interval. But if it's an augmented interval, it'll invert to a diminished interval. And for imperfect intervals, we have uh, augmented, again, will invert to a diminished. Diminished will invert to an augmented. And if it's major, it will invert to minor. And if it's minor, it will invert to major. Let's try one of these through and see how this works. So we have here this, our C sharp to B flat again. And let's say we want to invert this so that the B flat is on the bottom and the C sharp is on the top. So what we're going to do first is we're going to construct a, uh, we're going to do it the long way first. We're going to construct a B flat major scale and go from there. So B flat up to C sharp. Uh, we count up, we have B flat, and then we have C sharp, we've got a space and then a line, so that's going to be a second. Now we're going to compare it based on the major scale. We have a B flat up to C. We know B flat up to C is a major second because it appears within the major scale. That C has been raised one half step, so that is a C sharp. So we go from major to augmented, so we know that it's an augmented second. Now let's see what would happen if we had used that, that uh, mnemonic device, the uh, subtract from 9 and, slip, and flip the sign. So subtract from 9, our original interval was the C sharp up to B flat, a 7th. So we take 9 minus 7, that would equal 2. Now we flip the sign. It was a diminished 7th, we flip the sign and it becomes an augmented second. So subtract the 9, flip the sign gives us the same answer that we would get if we had worked that the long way through in dealing with inversions. To review, the distance between two pitches is commonly referred to as an interval, and intervals will have both a number designation and a quality designation. The number designation is determined by counting the lines and spaces between the two pitches, inclusive of the pitches themselves. Intervals smaller than an octave are simple intervals, and those larger than an octave are compound intervals. Whether or not the intervals are simple or compound does not necessarily impact how they will function musically. Interval quality is determined by whether the pitches match up to certain scale formations. Unisons, fourths, fifths, and octaves and their compounds can be either augmented, perfect, or diminished, and seconds, thirds, sixths, and sevenths and their compounds can be augmented, major, minor, or diminished.